Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I had a subscriber ask one doozy of a question. Oh, I'll flip his question in here, and let's talk about it. All right, he basically says, hey, you know, I've been thinking about this a long time, and, you know, given diminished returns and everything, as long as progressive overload is there, does it really matter in the long term uh, what sort of program a drug-free lifter uses who's not competing in anything? They're not trying to seek a maximum performance advantage. So let me put on my plus five out of weaponsmithing do a little bit of crafting and uh, let's talk about this. All right, um, this is one of those, but I don't want my cliff notes to be taken out of context, but they probably will. Uh, in the context of muscle gains, not performance components, just size, body composition. Um, if progressive overload is pre present and sufficient in the long term, does it matter? Fuck no, it doesn't matter. There, I said it. There, I said it. How's that for blasphemy? Even as someone who says, hey, this type of training will produce more results than others for drug-free lifters. This works. This works better. Blah, blah, blah. As someone who says all that, the truth is, in the long term, for a drug-free lifter, it probably won't matter. Uh, very, very little. There won't be a noticeable difference uh, if you don't care about maximizing performance elements and you're just concerned with, hey, how much muscle can I gain? Because the reason is, any program that incorporates progressive overload for all the muscles in your body will cause them to grow. Uh, that is undisputed. Every single expert in the world acknowledges that fact. It's understood. Progressive overload is the primary driver of muscle growth. The only difference that exists between training programs as far as hypertrophy is concerned, not performance elements because maximum speed, maximum power, joint angle specificities, how your body performs as one unit are all performance elements that are addressed by weight training. People who don't care about that stuff, who, not, who aren't competing in anything, uh, let's be honest. The only other factors that really matter in a training program for muscle growth are, one, how much are you growing every week, like in terms of total muscle protein synthesis uptime, meaning are you growing uh, 36 hours every week in that muscle, or is that muscle growing 72 hours or 90 hours every week? It's going to depend on frequency of training, um, how fast you're progressing. Uh, that's really all that it's, it's going to factor in, like how fast are you growing? How much time are you spending growing every week? How long do you spend at various plateaus? And that's where training programs differ. Frequency of training. So again, that's going to promote certain training styles. That's going to promote certain training styles. You know, like full body three days a week is going to generally promote maximal muscle protein synthesis uptime for a drug-free lifter. That means, doesn't mean they're automatically going to gain more muscle. It means they're going to gain it potentially a little more muscle. Potentially. That's not guaranteed. That's what we're looking at. Potential. Uh, how long do they stall? All right, that's where things like periodizations and stuff come in. If when you plateau, the methods that you use to progress and periodize through different training things, uh, different performance elements and stuff will affect how long you stall for any given period of time and how long you are stuck at a plateau. Is it going to be two weeks? Are you never going to plateau? Some training program and good programming should help you avoid plateaus most of the time. Or are you going to be stuck there for three months? So you end up missing three months of decent growth every year. Uh, because of plateaus, because you're not training ideally. But in the long term, is that going to matter? Probably not, because of every single time you kind of get bigger, you see diminished returns. Meaning, when you gain 10 pounds of muscle early on as a novice, uh, it'll take you a given amount of time. It's going to take you longer to gain the next 5 pounds of muscle than it was to gain the 10. So if you end up gaining a little slower, whether it's 20% slower, 30% slower, 50% slower. If you grow at half the rate, let's say you go on a body part split, and I think it's fair to say that most five-day-a-week body part splits are going to give you about half the growth per year that you could get from an ideal program. But that's still half the possible growth. All right, if you would have gained 15 pounds of muscle on that year, you're still going to gain seven. You know what? You're still going to be in a lower phase. Like if... That year of training would have taken you from being an intermediate to an advanced. That's also going to take you to a phase quicker to where you're going to gain less muscle per month and year. So you're going to be able to extend out new gains with a, a weaker program. Extend them out because you didn't finish your new gains out. So it might take you 18 months instead of a year. 
But once those new gains are done, you're going to be growing at probably half the rate that you were before that. So if you guys look at it that way and you look at the way that re you get diminished returns over time, as you progress more, eventually the gap between the two is going to get smaller. And here's what I mean. The ideal program, a certain amount of time will put you here. A less ideal program will take you to here. Then it's going to only bump you to here. This is going to come up to here. And then this is going to come up. And eventually, maybe that third year, fourth year, fifth year, they're going to be so close together that there might only be one pound of muscle difference between the two. Now, any of you honestly feel like a, a pound of muscle difference over the course of several years is really going to be noticeable in the mirror? Probably not. It's only going to register as one pound on the scale. Meaning if you were at 11% body fat with one of them and you were 185, you're going to be 186 with the other one. Is that really significant? Sure, it's significant. Does it matter tremendously? No. So because of the diminished returns that are going to happen over the years, over time, as you get closer and closer to your uh, maximum drug-free potential, that gap is going to close between a great program and just a eh, mediocre program. As long as it's got progressive overload, as long as you're progressing on it, as long as most of your big lifts are going up a little bit over time, you're gaining a rep, putting five pounds on here or there, gaining a rep here or there, you're still growing. No matter what, it's impossible not to. So over time, it's not going to be a much noticeable difference. That's why a lot of guys will be like, well, you know, I ran one of your programs and I gained the most muscle I've ever gained in six months. It was surprising. I gained more muscle than I did on this other program. So your programs are awesome. They're amazing. I can't believe how much I gained. But then they see someone else who's been training longer than them with a program that doesn't look as good. Like, but he's bigger than me. I don't understand. I mean, your program gave me fantastic gains, and this other guy's a little bigger than me, and he's running a program that, you know, isn't as good by your philosophy. How did he get bigger than me? Well, he's been training three years longer than you. You probably gained in that six months on my program. You may have gained more muscle than he's ever gained in six months. You might have gained a whole pound more muscle than he gained in his best six-month period. But you know what? It's still about time under the bar. It's still about years spent in the gym. The more years that you spend progressing is still going to put more size on you over time just with diminished returns. Now, if you continue to train with a good program, in two years' time, you might catch the guy and be at the same level he is. But the thing is, it just took you less years to reach where he was. You might have only been training two years and he's got four or five years. And in two years' time, you catch him. So it took you five years or four years running great programs to reach what he did in seven. And then both of you were seeing such diminished returns at that point that neither of you, you gained very much anything noticeable each year. So in the end, all you did with a better program was get bigger faster. It didn't give you the potential for more overall size. It didn't increase your total potential in the long term. It just helped you get closer to your maximum potential faster. And the thing to remember is that when people talk about natural limits, it's not like you're ever going to really reach your natural limits. And what I mean is, as you get closer to the perceived natural limit, you hit a diminished return scale. You'll probably never quite really reach it. You'll probably, you might get 95% there, you might get 98% there, but you won't really reach it because of those diminished returns are so much smaller each year as you get closer to it that you will eventually reach an age to where your maximum potential will start scaling down due to hormone differences, your body producing less testosterone, less growth hormone, um, connective tissue aging and recovering slower. Eventually, you're going to start regressing because your natural limit will then cap down to where you're already at and then probably start dropping further down from where you are and taking you with it. And that's the way to think of it too. Uh, there's that age factor that happens as far as a drug-free limit goes. And people just have to accept that, and that's okay. That's just part of aging. But, you know, as long as you are the best you can be at that age, when you get to 40, if you're the best you could possibly be at 40, in terms of your body composition and size, then does it matter? Because you're still doing better than most of the other 40-year-olds who are in the gym if you've reached your potential. Or if your potential from age comes, drops down, and catches where you really are. And, you know, takes you with it. Uh, but ultimately, the truth is progressive overload is the driving factor of hypertrophy. It is the most single most important factor. And as long as it's present, 
Some programs are going to do better than others. Some programs are going to make you stronger than others at the same size. Some programs are going to make you better at swinging a golf club than others at the same size because of the performance elements related to them. And I'm always big on that. That's something I'm big on. Even for guys who are saying, well, I just want size. Well, you should go ahead and get some performance to go with that size. You might as well. You're already putting the time in, in the gym. You might as well say, hey, what can my time in the gym do to help me with my other life endeavors? Maybe I play golf. Maybe I play tennis. Maybe I shoot three-gun comp. Maybe I like to go hunt, hunting elk up in the mountains. Stop and think through, hey, can my training help me with these endeavors? If so, what can I do? And, and I always tell anyone who's a recreational lifter, uh, you need to think in those terms. Why not? Why wouldn't you want to take your gym time and use it to make you better at things that you enjoy in life? So there's always the performance components to consider, but the body composition... It's just progressive overload. And yes, some programs are gonna let you grow faster than others. They're gonna let you get up too closer to that potential faster than others. But a good program doesn't ever really change what your maximum potential is. So a program that's you know, not as good will still eventually get you there. And that's where the confusion happens in the training world. Because they see someone who has opened a door and gone through it, their results, they assume that that person came up with the best way to open the door. And so when that person tells you, and you see this with training programs sometimes, that I got through that door by hopping around on one foot and turning left three times and saying uh, zippy, zippy, zoo, alakazam when I opened the door. And then people assume that that was, you know, the magic trick of how he got through the door. Whereas when someone else realizes the fastest way to get through a door is to walk up, turn the doorknob, push it, and walk through. But they both got through the door. You can't use getting through the door as the judgment of how effective something is. If one of them wasted a lot of time getting there, but here's the other question. What if the other guy really enjoyed and found a lot of fulfillment and uh, screaming alakazam after he jumped around three times on his left foot? Maybe he really enjoyed that. Can you quantify that? I don't know. So ultimately, I suppose it comes down to Train the way that you enjoy as long as it doesn't hurt you and it provides your performance elements you want. And remember, you'll eventually get where you're going uh, as long as progressive overload is there. Just some tools in the toolbox will get you there faster than others. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.